This morning, I just titled uh, the message that I've shared with you this morning as Battle Zone. And uh, just want to remind us about the fact that you and I are in spiritual conflicts, that there is an enemy that we are in conflict with. And the Bible has uh, several scriptures on this, just revealing that to us, saying that there is an enemy that we are fighting against. And I'll just remind us of one or two of those. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So we wrestle. And it's very interesting, that word that the Apostle Paul using, uses there, uh, he's actually talking about a wrestling match. You know, you can imagine two men just in combat and fighting. And the match ends when one of them is able to put the other on the mat or on the floor, hold the other person's neck in a gridlock, and that person can't come up. That's the end of the match. You know. But that's what he's talking about. We're in a wrestling match. It's, it's an intense combat. And it, he's talking about us fighting against, you know, a, a, an organized army, so to speak. He's talking about principalities, meaning chief rulers, uh, powers, meaning uh, demonic powers that derive, or that have delegated authority to them, given to them. He talks about rulers, meaning uh, demons that are, uh, uh, that are overseeing a territory of darkness, de rulers. And he's talking about spirits of wickedness, hosts of them uh, that we are contending with. So as believers, uh, we are in a, a spiritual battle. And many of you know the way the Lord Jesus put it in John 10 verse 10. You know, it's not on the slide, but you and I know that verse. He said, the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. So he, this is a very bad enemy. His intent is to steal, kill, and destroy. He's coming with that intention. To steal from us. Kill and destroy. But this morning, our intent is to expose the enemy. For who he really is. Now, so it's not a complete study on spiritual warfare or anything. But I just want to focus and just zero, zero in on two aspects I think that are important to us. You see, sometimes as believers, when we talk about the devil, uh, talk about, you know, what the devil's doing and so on, uh, I think many times we make the devil look much more bigger and more powerful than he really is. Unnecessarily. The devil's doing this and the devil's doing that and this and that, you know. But I want us to understand what does the New Testament tell us as believers? What is the devil, what's his situation, what's his condition really like? And so we're going to examine scriptures and intent, in intentionally we're going to look at several scriptures so that we understand what is Satan's position now, today, post the cross of Jesus. Now as we read these scriptures, some people might say, well, pastor, I know it's like that, but it's not really like that. You know? See, it's, this is happening and that's happening. Look, I believe that God said what he meant, and he meant what he said. God doesn't speak as man does. We say one thing and mean the other thing. But God doesn't speak that way. Whatever he says is truth. He says what he means, and he means what he says. You and I can take it the way it's written. This is what the word of God says, and this is truth. So here's the truth about our enemy. The Bible is very clear on these matters, and we will go through several scriptures. First of all, we need to understand that the enemy has been crushed. Genesis 3 verse 15, way back in the Garden of Eden, when uh, God is foretelling the coming of Jesus Christ in Genesis 3 15, here's what he says. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Let's read it together. He shall... Bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
When he's talking about bruising your head, it's mean like it's, he's, he's going to crush your head. He's going to stamp upon your head. That's a death blow. That's a complete victory over the enemy. He will crush your head. He'll bruise your head. John chapter 12, verse 31 to 33, Jesus is talking about what he's going to do on the cross. Here's what he says. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So he's talking about his death. He's talking about what he would accomplish on the cross. And Jesus Christ said that when he would die on the cross, something would happen to the devil. He would be cast out. The picture there is really, you're kicking a person out. Sending him out. Out. Evicted. Sent out. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross, did he do what he said he will do or not? Yeah. Satan has been cast out. He's been dethroned. He has been evicted. He no longer holds the same kind of sway that he once had. Because Jesus Christ on the cross cast him out. Or let's look at another thing Jesus said in John 16. Verses 8 to 11, he said, he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He said, when he has come and the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Verse 11, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. That word judge there simply means in the courts, this person, this, this ruler of this world has been sentenced. The verdict has been announced and he's condemned. He's convicted. It's done. The ruler of this world is judged. That means case is over, verdict is announced, he's condemned. And Jesus said, because the ruler of this world is judged. Means it happened right then when he died on the cross and when he went up into heaven. It happened. Satan has been condemned. So, you know, nowadays we have a lot of teaching going on on the courts of heaven. They say, come and present your case. My question is, if your opponent has already been condemned, what case do you want to present? Think about that. Your opponent has already been condemned. The case is closed. There's no need for you to come and present a case when your opponent has already been condemned. The, the verdict has been pronounced. Satan has been judged. He's condemned. And the Bible tells us we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. I don't attend court because the advocate is already there saying, I've taken care of everything. Case is closed. I'm deviating off a little bit, but I want us to understand Satan has been judged. The enemy has been disarmed. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Verse 15, what does it say? Having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Satan has been disarmed. Is it true or not? That's what the Bible says. He disarmed principalities and powers. And he made a public show of this. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he gained 
a great victory over Satan and all of his demons. He stripped them of all their power, disarmed them, and he made a public trial, a public procession where he showed, he displayed his victory over the enemy. He did it. Satan has been disarmed. And he has been destroyed. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children are partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death are all their lifetime subject to bondage. Notice what did Jesus do through his death? That through his death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. The word destroyed there, there are many different uh, de definitions for this word. It includes to render inactive, inoperative, uh, to cause a person or thing to have no further efficiency, to deprive of force, influence, power, to put an end to, to do away with, to annul, to abolish. He has destroyed the one who has the power of death. So, as far as Jesus is concerned, through what he did for you and me on the cross, the enemy has been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. Do you believe it? It's in the Bible. This is what the Bible says. Amen? Amen? Now think about this. Jesus did not need to do this for himself. Even before he became the incarnate son of God, he was the eternal word of God. And as the eternal word of God, he was absolute. He was God. There was no need for him to fight with the devil. The devil was, as far as he, him, Jesus is concerned, as the eternal word is concerned, he... he He's negligible, non-entity. Don't bother. But the only reason he did all of this was for you and me. As a representative of the human race. As the son of man, as a man, he crushed the head of the enemy. So think about this. In Matthew 28, when Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Does that mean he didn't have that before? No. He always had it. As the eternal word of God, all authority in this whole universe belonged to him. But the reason he's making that statement is because as a man, as a man, he triumphed over Satan. And as this man, who had been raised up from the dead. He is saying, I have all authority. One man put us under. This man brought us over. And he's saying, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Amen. So as far as Jesus is concerned, whatever he did on the cross, he did it for you and me. And this is the truth of the word of God. That our enemy... Is an enemy who's been crushed, who's been expelled, who's been condemned, who's been disarmed, and he's destroyed. And the kind of authority that God, Jesus envisioned for you and me to have is described there in Luke 10 verse 19. Jesus said, I am giving you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing will by any means hurt you. This is what Jesus said. He said the authority I'm giving you is going to enable you to trample. That means literally have mastery and dominion over the enemy. And he will not be able to touch you. He will have no power over you. He will not, he will by no means... Be able to hurt you. So as believers. 
As far as the devil is concerned, this should be our position. Let's say this out loud and bold. Satan and all his demons have been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. I stand and operate boldly with a sense of complete authority and dominion over the enemy. That's a believer. That's a believer. Amen? So no more should we talk, oh, the devil is coming. Shh, don't, 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 don't. don't. Come on. Know the truth about the enemy. He's been crushed. He's been expelled. He's been condemned. He's been disarmed. He's been destroyed. Jesus did it for you. Know the truth. And then you as a believer stand with absolute confidence. Knowing that you have authority and dominion over Satan. And all his demon powers. Jesus said that. So somebody says, the devil is doing something. Oh, let me call somebody. No, please. You go. I know what Jesus Christ has done for me. And I'll come. Boldly. If anybody's going to back off, it's going to be those demons. If anybody's going to be scared, it's going to be Satan. Why? Because Satan is crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and defeated. And you're walking in that victory. You're walking in that victory. You have to walk with that sense of absolute mastery over Satan and his demons. But now... Here's the question that I want to just address and point out Satan's game plan. Why then does this enemy seem so powerful? Sometimes causing havoc and destruction in the lives of people. Why? Why does this why does the enemy look so big? And I know he's doing things in the world. Uh, We're not addressing that. I want to just address us as believers. Why is it? What's his primary game plan? And we're not addressing everything. But I want to just focus in on this is Satan's strategy. And we need to be aware of it. So you imagine, imagine an army of soldiers who have all been disarmed. Who've got a good thrashing, but they've just been given a little time on in this space, in this territory. Just imagine. What can they do? What would they do? Maybe they will engage in propaganda, pretense, what we call as fake news. Let's pretend we've got a big army. They don't have any weapons, but we'll tell everybody we've got lots of weapons. We're just not showing it to you. And let's tell everybody that Jesus didn't actually defeat us. It really didn't happen. So they put some Facebook posts. (laughs) Let the news spread. Fake news. Make sure it gets into the church. So the church believes the fake news instead of believing the truth of the words. So now the enemy looks much bigger than he really is. The truth is, he's been crushed, he's been expelled, he's been condemned, he's been disarmed, and he's been destroyed. But he's got a false propaganda going on. And people believe it. Or he might resort to some guerrilla tactics, right? 
You don't have a too big of an army, but with the little you have, hit and run. Do something here, do something there. And it, it makes the enemy look much bigger than he is. So the apostle Paul, and, and we're just going to focus on some of his writings, not all. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, he exposes Satan's game plan. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he's, he's writing to the Corinthians. He says, you know, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. He says, look, we don't want the enemy to take advantage of us, because we are not ignorant. And we know his game plan. We know how he works. And so in the subsequent chapters here and there, Paul points out, the apostle Paul points out the enemy's game plan. Here's what he does. And if you trace through the book of 2 Corinthians, you'll see these things. In 2 Corinthians chapter, verse four, chapter 4, verse 4, he says the enemy uses blindness as a tactic. And this is predominantly, predominantly towards the unsaved. Because in verse 4, he's talking about those who do not know, the, uh, know Jesus, of course. But it's also a tactic that he can use against believers. Blind them. Prevent them from knowing the truth. Don't let, the, don't let them hear the truth. So this morning, you heard the truth. He's upset. But we don't care. <laughs> because his intent is, his game plan is blind them. Don't let people hear the truth. Don't let them know that actually Jesus Christ crushed my head. Expelled me. Condemned me. Disarmed me. And destroy me. Don't let them know. It's a blind people from the truth. In chapter 10, 2 Corinthians, Paul exposes more of the enemy's game plan, his tactics. He says he uses thoughts, arguments, reasonings, and mental strongholds. It's all going on in the mind. Here's how he engages or he gains access into people's lives through thoughts, through arguments, through reasonings. And mental strongholds, things in the minds. All of these are just feeble um, uh, weapons, if you want to call them that. But he uses that against, the, against God's people. Thoughts, arguments, reasonings, and mental strongholds. Gains areas, control of areas of our mind. The way we think. Or in chapter 11, verse 3, he says that... He uses craftiness to deceive and weaken. So he is a deceiver. But he deceives craftily. That means he doesn't appear in front of you and says, Hello, my name is Mr. D. Evil and I'm here to... He doesn't come like that. He's crafty. It means he's going to use certain ways and methods where an unsuspecting believer can get cheated, can get duped to believe a lie as it was a truth. So he's crafty in his deception. And what does deception do? Paul says deception weakens us. So when, you don't, when you believe a lie, it just weakens us. So he uses crafty Deception to deceive, craftiness to deceive and weaken. So you see everything here is surrounding the realm of the mind. This is how the entrance is gained for him then to do what he wants to do. The another, another way to look at, it, I look at this is in Ephesians 6 when Paul talks about our spiritual armor you can look at it like this, that every piece of armor, therefore, is, is intended to neutralize or to uh, uh, oppose a corresponding tactic of the enemy. And so you look at it that way. The helmet of salvation, therefore, tells us that Satan uses doubts or things that question our own salvation. Blind us. From knowing our salvation. Because the helmet protects the minds. So his strategy is 
I don't want them to know what their salvation really is. So for most believers, they think salvation is fire insurance. That means after I die, I won't end up in hell. That's part of it. But he does not want you to know that your salvation is here and now. And that your salvation includes mastery and dominion over the enemy. He doesn't want you to know the fullness of your salvation. The breastplate of righteousness. So righteousness is your breastplate. Obviously that is to oppose a, a, a tactic of the enemy which is unrighteousness. Uh, giving us a sense of uh, guilt, shame and condemnation or inducements to sin. The belt of truths. So his tactic would be lies, deceptions, untruth. That's why you and I need to have truths. The shoes of the gospel, good news of peace to move forward. So his tactic, therefore, a corresponding opposing thing would be news that produces the opposite of peace, which is strife, discord, ill will, disunity that will hinder our progress as believers. The shield of faith that is intended Therefore, his attacks would be doubt, fear, anxiety, worry, anything that's contrary to faith. Are you all with me so far? So this is a game plan. This is his tactic against the believer. To gain entrance. To weaken us. But as far as you and I, as believers, we must know that Jesus Christ on the cross he crushed the enemy, he expelled him, he condemned him, he disarmed him, he destroyed him. And that's the enemy. And that's how we're going to face this enemy. We're going to stand up against anything that he brings in our minds. Or he tries to weaken us in any way. So Paul instructs us in Ephesians 4 verse 27. He says, don't give place to the devil. And the word place there, uh, literally, it means any, any piece of land. So don't give any piece of land to him. Don't give him any space. Don't give him any place to uh, come in. But metaphorically, it means opportunity, power, or occasion for acting or doing something. So don't give the enemy any opportunity, power, or occasion to act or do anything in your life as a believer. That's what we are admonished to do. Don't give the enemy an opportunity. How does he seek opportunity? Through his mind games. Are you with me so far? That's his primary strategy. He tries to blind us. Uses thoughts, arguments, reasonings, mental strongholds. Uses craftiness to deceive and weaken and he comes against these areas of uh, different areas. That's how he's trying to seek entrance. But he says, look, don't give any place to the devil. So, oh, so devil I'm not going to accept these things. I'm going to let you know that I know the truth. I know what Jesus Christ did, for you, did to you through his death on the cross. So we submit to God. We resist the enemy. And the Bible says he will flee from us. We resist him. What I want us to take away this morning, and I know this is not addressing everything concerning spiritual warfare, but two important things. I want us to, as believers in Jesus Christ, be absolutely confident and be fully assured that the Bible is true when it says that Satan, our enemy, has been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. Amen? This is how we are going to view the enemy. This is it. Satan, I know the truth about you. And that's how I'm going to deal with him. And we operate. Boldly, with a sense of complete authority and dominion over the enemy. And secondly, what I want us to take away this morning is that we know his game plan. We know his tactics. His primary tactic. The, the way he seeks 
a foothold in our lives, a way he seeks to gain entrance. We are aware of it. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices or mind games. And so we are careful with what we let come into our minds, the thoughts, the things he says, the deceptions, the untruths, the lies, condemnation, accusation. We're careful against these things because these are his only ways or his primary ways to try to get into it. To guard against those things. Give him no place. Give him no opportunity, power, or occasion to work in your life. Amen? Those of you who are convinced, you may stand. <laughs> Let's call our worship team up, please. So this morning, we are just going to pray and declare that we know what Jesus did to the enemy. Amen? And that we are not going to let Satan play mind games with us anymore. That is tactics of trying to do all these things in our mind. And then therefore we kind of then begin to open the door and say, okay, come do things. No, we are standing against this. We will not give him any place in our lives. And so even as we just pray together, as I pray from here, I want you to receive and say, God, I receive the truth of your word. From this moment, I'm going to see myself the way Jesus Christ said I should walk concerning the enemy. That I will trample on serpents and scorpions or all the power of the enemy. That's me, a believer in Jesus. That's how I walk. That if I see or run into anything that the enemy is doing, I will stand in that place with that sense of absolute mastery and dominion and authority. That my intent will be to trample over those works by the authority of Jesus' name. That I will announce to the enemy that he has been crushed, that he has been condemned, that he has been expelled, that he has been disarmed, that he has been destroyed. I will, that's how I will approach it. Because that is the word of God. Heavenly Father, even as the truth of your word has been released in this place. I pray that every work of deception, every lie of the enemy, that we've knowingly or unknowingly embraced, that now those lies come crashing down. That every deception is destroyed. Every lie of the enemy is destroyed. We know the truth that through Jesus Christ, we will walk in authority. That God always causes us to triumph in Christ. That in every situation, we will emerge victorious. Because the enemy, the adversary has been destroyed. And I take authority in the name of Jesus. Satan over any and every work that you've tried to put in the lives of God's people in this place. And those watching, I take authority over every evil work. I take authority over every evil spirit. And in the name of Jesus, Right now, in this place, we destroy the works of the enemy. We destroy it. We reject lies. We reject fear. We reject intimidation. We reject depression. We reject anxiety. We reject fear. We reject torment and oppression. In the name of Jesus. Even as we are praying right now, some of you will experience freedom, will experience deliverance right there in your minds and from torment, from oppression, 
And I want you to stand your ground and say, I am free from those things. And this morning, you stand against anything in your life that you know should not be there. Or that you know is a work of the enemy. You stand against it. And you say, devil, I destroy that work. You can do it as a believer. So I want, to, I want you to do it. As you're standing right now in this place, you stand against any work that you know is not of God, is of the devil. And you take authority over it. You say, devil, I destroy it. It has no place in me. I receive the full blessings of the cross of Jesus. As you're standing here, I want you to do it as a believer. You do it. Father, I pray that each one here will rise up with strength, with courage, with boldness. I will dominate every work of the enemy. And we walk in victory. We walk in freedom. We walk in the blessings that Jesus Christ has provided for each one of us. We walk in it, God. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. take a few moments let the worship team lead us
worship you. You are the victor. I want you just to say this with men. Say it boldly. Uh, we're just going to let the devil know that we know that he's defeated. So we're going to say this out. Let's say it boldly. Say this, say this with me. Satan, Satan. I, want to let, I want you to know that every evil work you are attempting against me I destroy it you will not gain any entrance into my life into anything that concerns me you are defeated you are evicted you have no authority no place in my life I will walk in the fullness of God's blessings over my life. I am redeemed. I am delivered. I am victorious. I walk in power. I walk in authority. I walk in dominion. I'm a child of God. I belong to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you for causing each one of us, Father, to walk in victory, to walk in authority, to walk in the fullness of what you've got for us. The enemy has only one place, and he's, it's underneath our feet. And that's how we will walk as children of God, as people redeemed through the cross of Jesus Christ. 
as people who know the truth of the word of God we will walk in what Jesus Christ has made possible for us we thank you Father we bless you we honor you thank you before we close this morning there's anyone here this who's joined us in this service you're wondering what these people are crazy about what's going on but we love Jesus because we know he's real we know he's real he's our savior he's our Lord he's the one who forgives our sins who's forgiven us our sins he's brought us out of darkness into his wonderful marvelous light and he's made us sons and daughters of God and if you personally have never experienced this, we'd like to give you the opportunity to receive Him into your life, to have the same thing happen to you. Because Jesus Christ can forgive you your sin, make you a child of God, bring you into His wonderful, marvelous light. All you have to do is to ask Him to do it for you personally. So if you've never done this before in your life, I'm going to just lead you in a simple prayer before we dismiss. And I just give you an invitation, give you an opportunity to pray and ask Jesus to do this for you personally. So if you've never done this before, just join me in this little prayer. Would you just, if you'd like to do it, just say this with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me follow you. And you alone. For the rest of my life, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is anyone here, you prayed this prayer with me, this simple prayer, you prayed it for the very first time in your life. We want to celebrate with you. So if you don't mind, just raise your hand where you are. If you prayed this prayer with me this morning, for the very first time, just raise your hand where you are. I see one hand, two hands. Wonderful. God bless you. Anybody else up there in the balcony? Up in the balcony third hand waving at the back God bless you God bless you so just put your hand up high because uh, our greeters will come to you there's one up there one at the back there our greeters will come to you and give you a green bag or a red bag it has free resources that we want to give give to you so if you pray and just raise your hand up please uh, make sure uh, keep your hand up high so they come and give it to you there's also a card that they will give you that says decision card and if you can write your name and number on that card they'll come back to you in a minute and receive that card from you uh, somebody from the church office will call you and just tell you how to use the resources that are in the bag so if you pray that prayer raise your hand up make sure you receive these resources before you leave just give the card back to them, just fill it up give it back to the person who came to you or come to you and uh, we will be in touch with you uh, this week. So, wonderful. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.